All right, everybody. Looks like we're live. Change the format today. Hold on. Satisfy my... There we go. Change the format a little bit to today. There is no intro video. There will be no intro rant. I was thinking of starting with a Justin Trudeau video, but it would be a non sequitur to this discussion that we're going to have today. I was thinking of starting with a, a Jeffrey Marsh video, but I don't want to start... Um, I want to start this from the beginning and I don't want to have any distractions or anything that could be misinterpreted, misconstrued, or otherwise uh, pre-frame the discussion that we're going to have uh, for everyone watching this. And some of you might be new to this, although some of you uh, who've been following me for a while will um, be familiar with the interview that I did with Chloe Cole uh, a few months ago, telling her story, following it up, talking about the lawsuit that she's filed against the medical practitioners who participated in her transitioning. We're going to be talking with uh, an individual named Richie today. Um, he's on Twitter. It's Tulip R slash Richie, who is a, uh, I say a young man in that he's 30, in his 30s, early 30s, who has, um, we're going to get into the details and I'll let Richie explain the, the, the 30,000 foot overview, but someone who at one point um, got into the philosophy of transitioning from male to female, um, went through the physical procedures, woke up and, and it's not, regret is probably not um, anywhere near a remotely serious enough term for it, uh, realized the error in everything and has now become uh, a vocal advocate for um, detransitioning and awareness on this issue. I, it's a fortuitous, I don't even know how it happened yesterday. I'm sitting there scrolling through Twitter and I come across a Twitter thread from Richie, which which concerned me a little bit in the tone and the and the content of the of the of the of the tweet thread. And then I was like, this story sounds familiar. I reach out and say, would you mind coming on on the channel to discuss? And Richie says, yes. Then I spent the better part of last night and this morning catching as many interviews as I could that that Richie gave on other platforms. And I, I know a lot of the story now that I know where we're going to go with with the discussion of my questions. But this is going to be eye-opening for those who, who are unaware of what's going on, and it's going to be enraging for those who are, and it's also going to be sensitizing for those who think they understand and think they're in a position to judge what I call the victims of this entire um, frenzy, this, this psychological frenzy that we're seeing in the world go on in the medical community today. So everybody share the link around, tweet it out. We're, gonna, we're, we're live on both Rumble and YouTube. Let me just make sure we're good on Rumble. We are. Um, and we're going to go, we're going to cut it on YouTube and go to Rumble sooner than later. But Richie is in the background. Um, yeah, someone said jump scare. You, you all got used to the intro videos. Well, not today, people. Jump scare with this. I should have been staring at the camera like this. Mm. All right. I'm bringing Richie in. Richie, get ready in three, two, one. Richie, how goes the battle? Hi, David. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for not putting me next to Jeffrey Marsh, because I would hate to be compared to um, that individual. Well, and, that, and it's it's funny, like, because there there are people out there who um, who have become the faces of, of one side of the movement and who uh, who are the basis of people ridiculing everyone who's caught up in this from victimizer to victim and so i i, I said i'm going to err on the side of just we're going to leave this as a blank slate and then people can now after listening to this go and reassess who, the people who have become the faces of this movement for good and for bad um thirty thousand foot overview i don't know if you've ever uh, i sent you the link to my um chloe cole interview but in general i, I delve into childhood and, and it's it's going to be all the more relevant to, uh, for this yeah. discussion Thirty thousand foot overview before we get into that sure let's go so um I am male, obviously. Um, I was born in 1987 in the northeast of England in a former mining town. Um, my dad was a, a miner, and the northeast of England is quite a, a tough place to grow up if you're... It's generally just a, a more difficult place to grow up anyway. Um, but... I knew very early on that I was different from all the other lads. Um, very aff affectionate, very soft, and you know, I was I was gay, and I hated, I hated it. I hated the fact that I was gay, and when I really realised that I was gay, about 
I think it was somewhere about 11 13 that I really like started to to think oh shit I'm gay um in the background I already had really bad obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety and stuff like that and um I was obviously very depressed and growing up in the 90s was one thing in itself but growing up in the northeast of England it was like really homophobic so all the messages I was getting were you know how wrong I was and how wrong anyone who thinks this way so I'd kind of catastrophized a lot and I was very small for my age for up until about like 15 or 16 because I went through a very very delayed puberty not like because of blockers or anything mm -hmm. just had a delayed puberty and um because of that and because I'm like a big cam and stuff I got I got really badly bullied in school and around that time um, my parents were sort of going through a divorce as well. Um, and the reason I'm bringing these up is this isn't just my story. It's like all of our stories seem to be carbon copies, right? You know, you've got somebody, a kid, and they don't always have to be gay. It's not just the um, gay kids who are just getting caught up in this. This is just any affectionate or, or soft kid that gets drawn into this movement, but we'll come on later that down the line. Um I was obsessed with the internet from about 10, got me on internet connection at 12. Um, you know, back in the days when you used to dial up and if somebody picked up the phone, you'd get disconnected and you'd be like, Mom, fucking bother with the phone. <laughs> I'm trying to like, download a song. <laughs> you were born in 87, so that makes yeah. you eight I'm 35. years. 35. Um, yeah. and, and people who didn't grow up with the advent of the internet will probably have no idea what we're talking about, but like <laughs> dial, dial up internet with that. Oh, and like, and it's so good when it connected, man. Oh yeah, it was, and then someone would pick up the phone and it would interrupt everything. But back it up just one more step here. So your dad is a miner. Yeah. A, a, a coal miner, you said? Yeah. Now, if I may ask, you know, your dad's demeanor as a parent, is he big, burly, not putting up with effeminate behavior? Or is there, there's no element of him that's living something of a repressive life that he then imputes onto you? This is, this would be more a situation of a big, burly miner My dad who... My dad's a good man, I think, but he's a man of his time. He's a quite traditional. Um, you would say he's quite not like he's not like pushing people over, but he didn't take any shit. You know, I've I've seen him confront people and stuff like that, and um, scary dude. You know, to be on the wrong side of him, but I think because I was the youngest and I had an older brother, me and my brother were like totally different. Um, my brother was very much like him, you know, he's very easily masculine and, you know, he just wasn't like me. And I think my dad was just like, meh, whatever, I've got one straight son, so whatever. So I don't think me, I think I, when it comes down to like the the sense of like rejection and fear and stuff like that, I think a lot of it was my catastrophization because of what I'd seen when in sense, I think parents know the kids quite well from a young age anyway. Um, like when I was initially when I was very little like when I was four I demanded like you know like a play kitchen that was normally for girls and stuff and he went fucking ballistic on that <laughs> but you know I got it anyway and nothing well I say nothing happened but something did <laughs> we'll get on to that <laughs> um and about when I got to about seven or eight and I, I was trying to be a ballerina and I know it's really cringe but whatever um and I had like a very, very typical experience as an effeminate boy growing up, you know, it was just a very hard environment to do it in. And I think a lot of it was like the fear of that. And, uh, but I think, so, so, I'd... sorry. Like, like, so, but your dad now, so that I'm, I'm just, you know, giving him the name of the minor dad, um, burly minor dad. He has a kid, one of, you're the youngest of three, two boys, one girl. Um, yeah, me, older, my sister's the oldest, and then okay. me and my brother. And so he's got, the youngest kid is into kitchen sets and ballerina at the age of seven or eight. Is he trying to talk you out of this or, no. and, and there's, there's no coercion. There's no sort of, it's just like, okay, now when you say parents know their kids, they do, but sometimes they also live in the most, uh, serious of denials where they say, my kid's not, you know, my kid's not gay as if that would be a bad thing. Was your dad in denial or was it just acceptance or was it sort of dismissive like okay i'm gonna write that one off and i'm gonna focus on the one who's not gay maybe it's hard to tell i'm reluctant to speak for him because i've never sat down and had a 
proper conversation with him. We are quite distant now because of transition, but we are like in contact, but I haven't seen him in quite a few years. Um, and like, we've got like very limited text contact and stuff. Um, what happened was when my parents divorced when I was like 16, um, when it got like put through and everything, um, I became a little bit resentful and distrustful of my dad because of like affairs and stuff. And I'd learned about this myself, like before all that, um, because my dad was using the internet to hook up with people and shit, right? Um, and obviously I'm like, you know, perpetually online. Of course, I'm gonna know what everyone else is doing on the computer. And uh, because of that, I had this real sort of sense of like, I kind of, unf like I hated him for it, to be honest. And it took a long time to get past that. And when I was in my early twenties and I was like, matured past that teenage angst of hating your dad for walking out on the family, whatever, right? Um, were getting sort of like making amends and it was nice and then I transitioned and fuck that just uh, threw, a, threw a pipe in the wrench completely. 11 to 12 to 13, you, you definitively know you're gay. H how, does that, how does that affect you growing up, going to school and demeanor wise? Are you, are you, living, in, uh, like, are you living in shame, in, in hiding it or? Shame, denial, completely. Did not want to acknowledge it. Terrified to acknowledge it even though everyone else was like saying it, you're like, we know, you know, like in a way, like, um, I think a lot of everyone saw it coming before I did, ironically enough. Um, and I think it was one of those things where I just built up the fear so much in my head and that had really built up like the sense of this is going to be a terrible outcome for everyone, least of all me, but no one, no one give a shit really, I think. Me mother knew very early on I was like different and that, you know. Um, and I think for me, uh, me dad, I think you might be right that there was a sense of denial in both of us. Um, but there was definitely some acknowledgement. But what it did do is when I'm like 11 to 13 is it made that OCD really, really bad and um, made it worse and the inside. You just got like out of control. And I went on the internet to talk with other while I was looking for other gay people my age, but the late nineties and chat rooms, when you're like 12 and 13 were not safe places. You did not find other kids your age, funnily enough, you just found predators. Um, and I had a period of time when I was just talking to these men and it originally started on games like Diablo 2 because you had like this chat function in the what, game. What is, what's the game Diablo 2? Diablo 2, man. Total brilliant game, you know. You know Diablo at all? I I, uh, I was never much into that. I'm this was long... when Blizzard wasn't, like, totally shit, right? I have you no know? idea what Blizzard is. <laughs> it's a game. All oh, right, okay. Never mind. It's a game. Are these, yeah. are these like, interactive fighting games, or are they, uh, like, Minecraft? You know World of Warcraft? Uh, yeah, kind of, I guess. Yeah, that's Blizzard. That's okay. Blizzard made that, yeah. And so you have the chat function where you go to meet and, and like, you know, when I was a kid, we were I was talking to people on the internet. I used to play a game called Acrophobia, which had a private chat, or it had a, it had a main chat and a private chat. Yeah. And uh, you, you realize now that, yeah, people back then were not who they said they were, but you're now a young gay kid looking to meet, you know, innocently, naively, and genuinely trying to meet other, other kids who are going through the same thing. And you you quickly realize that these are not kids, but rather adult predators online looking to meet kids. That's the simple way to describe what happened over a long period of time, because I don't want to paint it that like everyone online is a predator, because what had happened is I'd started playing games like Unreal Tournament. This is probably, you know, I don't know if you know that game either. These are all PC games, PC masters. And um I started like chatting with a like lot of guys in there as a lot of internet gaming is predominantly like occupied by males. So I became very used to talking with people and, you know, it just felt like a um, mutual sort of thing, but there was always like this boundary pushing conversation that would happen at one point or another. And it wasn't like it was if I was going online and I'm going to search out these men. It was very, there was a lot of op opportunism as well. And I was so desperate to, talk about these things but in in my own way that i knew how to um and my only safe guiding factor when i was 12 and 13 was the internet speeds were really shit mm -hmm. um so you, like there was not there wasn't that danger for the cam cam stuff until 2000 when 
for my 13th birthday, I'd saved up money to get a webcam and it was quite expensive then because it was like the early life cam webcams, like 360p ones. And by that point, I had like Skype, MSN, ICQ. Um, I, w I had all these identities and easily reachable and, you know, you, you've got shit self-esteem, you're getting bullied and you're spending more time online and you talk to these guys and they just tell you what you want to hear. And one thing just leads to another and before you know it, you, you're just doing what they, are, they want you to do. Did, um, I, I, I'm reluctant to ask the question and I'll, we, we talked for a couple of minutes before this and I told you, like, I, I ask a lot of questions. There's nothing malicious and there's nothing, I, I don't know what the opposite of exhibitionist is. It's not like rubbernecking that I'm asking these questions. It's because this is a world that people either don't know about, don't fully yeah. understand or don't want to understand. When you're meet, does, does this online interaction actually result in, in real life meetup? No, no. Okay. No, so, that didn't, that fortunately never, ever happened. And, never, ever happened once. So you're 12, 13, and now 87. So in 2000, you're 13. You get a webcam, and, and things start getting worse in terms of the rabbit hole of the interwebs. W when does it... What I was it... doing as well, like um, requests. So, you know, there were, like you would get a request to take a picture or a snapshot because there wasn't... You couldn't really have video calls that well. You could like later on when I was like 16, 17, but by then it was in in a way there was like a degree of protection because of that, the bandwidth issue. So you could only really do snapshots off your webcam. So it would be like, take off your shirt and shows your chest, snapshot that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And like, it would be like dumb things, like hold this object in this way, but you don't know what you're doing. You just, you just fulfill these requests that you think are stupid, but they're getting a the sexual kick from. Because it's all like somehow linked back to their, I don't know what it is, it's some dominating crap, but um, I did that for a couple of years. And when I got a 15, 16 and you had videos, I started doing video calls, but all of that's when I realized all the guys were like, I wasn't attracted to any of them because I didn't really like seeing them. We're just like old, old men, basically. Um, like one of them was like, more certainly at least the same age as my granddad or older and i'll never forget that video call like what happened in there but that was the shit bits of the internet but that wasn't all the time that was that was like that time when you're not playing the games and you're not doing whatever you're doing as a teenager it was like the later points in the evening and, and stuff like that you know when you get fueled and stuff as i say um and that's what led to that but the reason i mentioned that is for a lot of day for a lot of day trans males because males and females have got a totally different pipeline is whether it was in early transition or before they were transition there's always this period of like over exposing themselves online whether it's to other adults or other children or adults as children when they are kids but there's like Again, this doesn't apply to every single trans person. I'm just talking about the people like me who have got a lot of mental health issues and you come into this for the wrong reasons um, to escape yourself. And doing everything that I did initially did kind of give us a little bit of a confidence boost, but it also eradicated my self-esteem because I had this fear of what would happen if those pictures get leaked out in school to me family and stuff like that. There was always that fear in the background and I always believed that I was going to get in trouble for it somehow I'd, I don't know I, it was probably what was being said to me and I can't remember the exact details but it was something along the lines that what I was doing by sharing pictures was illegal because of my age so I would get in trouble do you know what I mean yeah so that's kind of what some of the panic was um and obviously I had the bullying and I had I had a what's called a cholesterol hematoma, which is like a really bad ear infection that eats at the bone. So the only way to cure that is to have a surgery where they remove inner part of the ear and uh, I'm half deaf because of that. And that all is all happening at the same time. And, you know, my mom and dad's uh, relationship is coming to an end mm -hmm. and having a shit time online, shit time at school. And it was just a fucking disaster for us. It, it, like the, the perfect storm of vulnerable children who can be exploited um, for ideological purposes. 
Uh, the question that I had was this. And now, you mentioned OCD. I imagine you've since been diagnosed. Were you were you seeing any therapists at the time as a child, or is this sort of a, a retro? Just like different time period. You know, you just didn't. That just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It was rare for kids to go see therapists and that, and probably just as well because I think of all the therapy I've ever had, and I don't know if it's ever really helped anything. I well, really I can tell you what, listening to a bunch of interviews, it's, it certainly has helped you now put things into perspective and actually understand uh, your responses. I, I've listened yeah. to a few interviews and you, in one of them, I forget which one, where you described yourself as, or you were described as aggressively smart, or I forget how the, how you described it, but and I'm thinking like aggressively smart and 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 um, very fragile as well, or or vulnerable. And that, you know, it, it explains a bit of the trajectory, but okay, so you're you're a teenager, a kid gay living with that sort of shame in an era where it, 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 it wasn't as popular as it is today parents are getting divorced dad has had some issues that caused some animosity um when when does it take the path into changing you know uh, people take issue with the term transition so, because you can't but uh, like when does it go to there because one of my underlying I, theories is, is from, that go for it from a very young age i wanted to be seen as a girl and that is a very natural reaction for kids who most likely end up gay it's so normal and it, it's because you relate to your female peers and, and not in matters of sexuality you just in interest and demeanor and how you are and stuff like that so you think oh therefore i must be a girl and i want to be seen as a girl because that's my crowd i don't fit in with these boys because I'm not like them, you know, they're, they're playing with mud and stuff and I'm not interested in that, right? That's, that's, that sort of thing. And that brain worm had started very early on, you know, very early on. And I liked, you know, people would always run up to us when I was like 10 or 11 and be like, are you a boy or a girl? And they'll pretend they hate it, but I secretly loved it because it was like, yes, the, the confirming that I'm a girl, you know, even then. Um, but again, it's that whole sort of thing. If I'm a girl who likes boys and I think, I wasn't thinking it like this clearly then, but you can see how the logical loop goes. Then it doesn't matter if I'm gay because I'll just be just like a girl. This is the problem, you know, I'm in the wrong. So something must have happened. So around that age, when I started like getting the anxiety about being gay, that kind of came out my mind and it turned into wishing that I was a girl. So I would pray that, you know, at first I was praying that I don't want to be gay and then it was like please make me a girl and I was hoping I would just wake up the next day as a girl and that would solve all the issues because obviously um, I'd, I'd perceived that that would somehow be an easier existence. So I had all this horrible shit mental health and from about 17 to 24 I just basically sat inside and played World of Warcraft all day, every day, non-stop. Um, never went outside, didn't care on my body and just got drastically overweight. You know, do you know that South Park episode where they're all playing World of Warcraft and then just get fatter and fatter and fatter? What's, was, uh, what's, what's South Park? That South Park. I'm joking, Richie, that I'm joking about. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, I'm joking. I've watched South Park. I was more a Simpsons and Family Guy guy because I never right. appreciated how ahead of the time uh, South Park was. Plus, I can't watch it with my kids, so. Um, but no, I don't, that's a joke. So, uh, no, I, I don't know the specific episode, but I can sort of imagine se multiple years, you're just indoors living a, uh, the unhealthiest psychologically, physically of lifestyles. I, I know, I know in one of the interviews you described how much weight you put on, I mean, how much, how much was it? It was 145 kilograms. So it's about 300 pounds. So. How, how, how tall are you? If I may ask. I'm about five now. Um, about five seven five eight because i've lost about an inch and a half of height because of the fucking pressure of me. don't worry please because of the um the blockers and the uh estrogen it curves your spine naturally so i've got like a hunch at the top and at the bottom of my back there's like this you everyone has like sort of slight natural curve but mine looks like indented do you know what i mean a, cur a curve inwards at the lower back yeah um, okay yeah really quite quite protruding as well so whilst obviously my height will always be what what it should have been which is like five nine 178 centimeters um which is about five eight five nine or whatever but it's now like 174 
centimeters and it's just that's all because of the curvature but we'll get on to that just back yep. to story time yes 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 um yes so by the time i was in my early 20s me ocd was out of control which i'd had for many many years you know i'm talking like intrusive thoughts um rituals so that's like not like demonic rituals like you would develop a habit and the first time you do this habit for instance i would have compulsions to pray or touch certain objects in the room before i went to bed and the reason would do that when you're all cd is because the first time you did it um and it wasn't planned it it relieves your stress at that moment so your brain says repeat that behavior because it made you feel better last time but it doesn't because it was just a one-off fluke that is your brain's just kind of misfired in so you end up doing all these crazy and they are crazy it's like for instance before i went to bed i would have to and I'd lost me religion by me early 20s completely. Like I wasn't religious anymore, grew up like semi-religious. And um, I would compulsively pray, even though I wasn't praying. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So like, well, you're, you're ta- I, I'm, I'm familiar with obsessive compulsive disorder um, and you know h- how it materializes in terms of potentially like picking at the skin, dermatomil- dermatillomania, trichotillomania, or because pe- people sort of like visualize OCD and think of Dustin Hoffman from Rain Man as opposed to the more uh, psychological aspect of what they call pure OCD, which is a very, very minimal physical manifestation, but all of the elements of their psychology. I'm glad you brought up pure because I got diagnosed with that. And so what happened was uh, terrible shit mental health. And by the time I was like 22, 23, I was like, I can't go on like this. I'm just going to kill myself. <laughs> like, I just can't like the panic attacks. And when I say panic attacks, if you've never had one, it literally just feels like you're having a heart attack. Um, like, you know, you can't breathe, your chest is tight, and your heart's like beating so hard it hurts. It's just it was it was unbearable. So I went to the doctor and I was like, describe the symptoms I was having, and he put us on an SSRI called sertraline. Mm-hmm. Um that is a keynote too, because a lot of people, again, in my circumstance, because I know a lot of other D-trans males who are in my situation, um, they all seem to start on some sort of behavioral med or SSRI or antidepressant or some shit like that. Something, something, uptake, in, what is it, the, the uh, um, uptake serotonin inhibitor. uptake inhibitor, yeah. neural inhibitor. I should know this. I've been on it for like over a decade now, so I should know it. I'm still on it now because I can't, I've been on, I'm on like a very, very high dose and I can't come off it because when I come off it, I get really bad. So it's obviously working still. Um, and anyway, so I started, um, I started getting help for that. And when you, um, bring this up with the doctor, it triggers like other local therapies. So you start at like a very low level therapist, like a nurse practitioner, uh, who does what's called cognitive behavior therapy. So it's yep. like CBT. Very, very basic six steps you know and you know that all the nurses i've ever encountered and i don't know if this is a british thing versus us because everyone says in the us it's not the same um but nurses in the uk are amazing i love them a bit they have i've never had a bad experience with a nurse never not once um and she was a lovely lovely woman and she was one of the first people that kind of sort of acknowledged she was like i don't think this is just anxiety i think there's a lot more going on so she referred us to a psychologist at um, a nearby mental health hospital so i went to the hospital not as an inpatient um and i saw this guy and he was a psychologist and um i started they started talking about my intrusive thoughts and that's when he started like delivering um challenges to them because i felt i was like really evil for thinking mm-hmm. like all these horrible gruesome thoughts in my brain like that a lot of them were very violent but and discounted all the shit i'd seen online you know like the early internet was wasn't tame you know like, the, the early internet I've, I've mentioned this before was was the holy grail of evil like it was it was murder videos accident videos uh porn but mo- mostly the the violent accidents the violent murder stuff which industrial I, accidents and yep. all that shit and um, it it was literally like a watered down mk ultra experiment it really was oh well and, if, if anybody knew what live live leak in the beginning or on uh, this website called augrish in the beginning 
You know what? I'm, I'm going to use this as a, as a good segue. I'm going to end this on YouTube, not because we're going to talk about anything that I can't. We're, I'm going to put this up later, but let's move over to Rumble, everybody. So three, two, one. Yeah, like uh, the, these websites were at, at one point in my life when I had, I thought I had watched too much. And I, I think it's, I, I don't want to like pull the, this, there's this journalist who said he got PTSD from firing an AR-15 in America. Not, not to talk about, not to minimize PTSD, but you, you see things which you never forget. Uh, they, they traumatize <laughs> yeah. you. And at one point I was like, I was going to draft legislation for the Canadian government to make those types of videos, uh, you know, make it illegal to host those online. But um, that was back in the day. Yeah, no, sorry. So yeah, the early days was was bad stuff. So you're saying maybe these intrusive thoughts of, of horrific images, uh, you know, sexual perversion stuff in, in my mind had to do with what I've done to myself by watching these videos on the internet. And yeah, I definitely felt it was my fault for like exposing myself to some all those execution videos and all the gore and shit that was freely available. And it did, it scared the hell out of us because I generally felt like when I was in a railway station or a bus station that I, will, I can control the compulsion to jump in front of a bus or something or jump on the rail track. So I would sit on my hands on the, on the chair and like, you know, and I knew I was never going to do it or I felt like I was going to push someone. Of course I was never going to do it. And, but, and, um, and and you end up, you not only feel scared for yourself, but you also feel guilty yeah. for having these thoughts and you think you're a bad person for having yeah. that intrusive thought of shoving someone into the rail. And, and, and I couldn't trust myself because of that. And, you know, and everything that I did think, every good thing that I did, I couldn't trust myself. I, I believed every good thing I did was some sort of narcissistic maneuver for recognition or something, everything. So no, even if I was doing good things i couldn't feel good about it i was always feeling shit anyway psychologist kind of delivers one or two um ultimatum well not an ultimatum but challenges you know it was like really if you were evil would would you worry about this if you were evil like really and i was like well that's a good point i suppose i don't think evil people worry about how evil they are they're just evil right and i was like okay um well, my, and my, then... my, my flip side to that is this is why i think i you know i, I would destroy therapist like flip sides that is well would it would good people have these thoughts in the first place now i know the answer to the question is that everybody has these thoughts yeah. and they just become more uh trouble not troublesome but more uh invasive and destructive for some people which is where natural normal thoughts turn yeah. into disorders that they characterize by by conditions so that that would have been my response to the therapist and that might have ended the relationship there but <laughs> sorry so yeah so I they say would, would a good would a, would a psychopathic person have those thoughts and you and your response is what uh well i was just and I, I you know the the challenge kind of did give us a little bit of relief and then the next week he came back on the next session with a printout on pure all right like funny you mentioned it and um, that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. And I was like, um, okay. And, and when I was reading, I was like, this is exactly, exactly it. But at that moment, <laughs> something else was happening. I had discovered the, I discovered gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered the trans forums. At the, about the week he gave me that pure all thing, I discovered that. What, what this, year is this again? And how old are you? This is 2013 and it would have been... Okay, so you're 23, 25. 20, 25. Okay. 25. And yeah. you're at this at this time as well in the... What's the word? Conf, is the word confluence? It's like the, the merging of all of these things. You are you have just started taking SSRIs? Uh, yeah, I'd been on them for about a year at this point. Okay. For six, six, seven months at this point, I would okay. say. Um, and a friend at work who's a gay guy... Um, announced to everyone he was transitioning and I was like oh wow you can do that is that a thing that you can do I didn't know about that and that sent us to the trans forums to to find out about it and I basically told them all I was like listen um this is my upbringing these are the things that happened and everyone was just like 100% trans and I believed them so I went back to my therapist the next week and I went forget everything we just talked about forget it I have figured it out. It's not, I am 99% sure because, you know, you've got to leave 1% for doubt that I am trans. And then he was like, oh, okay. And then the next week I came at him with fucking crazy eyes. And I was like, bro, I am 100% sure I'm trans, 100%. And he was like, okay, then. But at that moment, those sessions are coming to an end. So he wasn't in a position to 
sort of challenge that. So what he did is he noted my obsessive nature and that I had now apparently thought that I was trans. So he'd kind of put that in quotation marks, if you know what I mean. So it was yeah. like he knew what was going on, but he knew that I just basically entered another obsessive state. And at that time, as those were ending, because I'd found my solution to why I was the way I was, I, um, I as instructed, self-referred to the gender clinic, because that's what you do in the UK. You, no one gets referred without their own say-so. You go to the GP and say, I think I'm trans, can you refer us to the gender clinic? So I rang my doctor and told them pretty much a broad outline of my history um and again she noted like the red flags too and it, again it's not their job to be like oh i don't think this is right it's like oh that's very difficult blah 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 i'm sorry to hear that it must have been so thing and like so difficult for all this time to do it you know, let, let, so, me, let me stop you there though it's not like and this is not to push back on anything it's just to understand the role of the doctors here you are someone who's being treated with ssris for ocd pure well the puro is just a subset of ocd but you're being treated for Men, what they qualify as mental conditions, and you come in and you say to the person treating your mental issues, this is the solution to my problems. Why is it not that doctor's responsibility to say, you think it's the solution to your problems, but it's actually a symptom of your problems? Like who, who if anybody says that to you? I think it's because, you know, they may not have the specialty to diagnose between that or differentiate. So they could be catastrophic in the sense that, they might be totally wrong to say that and it's all about liability and risk so if they they can't just give me a diagnosis without saying me Somebody so then they, to you. they then refer you to the gender gen clinic. the gender clinic whose essence whose whose raison d'etre is to transition people not to talk them out of it that was beautifully put by the way um yes it that's pretty much it so um that was the end of 2013. Yeah, end of 2013. So I knew the waiting list was like 15 months, but I had it in my head that testosterone was poisoning my body and it was causing me OCD and it was causing all my mental health problems. So um, what didn't help was the forum I was on, there was a lot of older trans. The uh, forum, uh, you're, you're talking Reddit at this point? No, no, this is a transform. Like, do you know the old PHBB three boards? Like the old forum software? No. Like I feel like an idiot. What, what the hell was I doing? In 2013, I'm 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 only eight years old. What am I doing at this time? 2013. Yeah, eight years old in 2013. No, eight years older than you. I'm 40, I'm 43. Oh, so 2013, what the heck is my problem? I'm, 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 yeah, I guess I'm in the, I'm in the throes of law, so I'm distracted from the rest of the world. Um, so no, I don't know what that is, but this is, pre, you're, this is pre, pre Reddit, and also this is pre, um, social. Oh, Reddit trade. was around. It was just really based at the time. No one okay. used Reddit for trans shit then, like okay. barely. It was us, tra us transgender came around in before then. It was like 2008, but it was not used much okay. until about 2014. Sorry, and I didn't know so question. No, 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 I interrupted you. I, well, no. So t t you're, you're on these, these boards, these message boards, and how does that play into confirming the decision that you've come to? So these are all what you would largely classify as sexually driven transitioners, people who a lot of them had no intention to medically transition, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, and some of them, well, some of them, they all literally look like men wearing dresses when they would post pictures. But what would happen is they would post this picture and everyone would be like, you look amazing, gorgeous. And I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell, they don't like, but whatever. And um, when I would talk to them and then I would share a picture, I would get the same, but it would be more intense, be like way more intense. And then they would say shit like, you don't want testosterone to poison your body like it has with mine because you're young now because I was 25 and they were like if you do this now you will seamlessly pass and blend in and all that sort of shit so I'd really had this motivation in us that a this was the source of all my stress the testosterone was the poison and to listen to them because they had similar lives to me when I didn't really count on that <laughs> they some of them were just gay repressed men too but some of them were just sexually fueled for every reason it's 
there are there are mixes to the dichotomy. And the idea that you you have this idea in your head that testosterone is the poison, and you people with OCD one one of you know they feared fear germs. I say they, we fear germs and the idea like there's radiation around here. And, and this is just, this is just mutatis mutandis, a, 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 a form of variation of that OCD yeah. element. Um, and, but I'm, I'm sort of fixated on the idea that these individuals on these forums, and I don't think it's ever changed in nature, but only in degree and, and severity are these are these are people are they asking to meet you in person are these bona fide what we call groomers who are looking to get yeah you? we did i did meet with some of them in person and that's another story unfortunately um yeah i did meet with some of them in person to my there were some really dodgy characters in there um that's all i'm gonna say but one of them not all of them were a few of them have what turned out to be like good friends and stuff, and they were very similar to me. But some of them were just as delusional as me. But there were some bad events that came out of that forum, and it wasn't just me who suffered. A lot of people who there was lots of meetups and stuff, and they always target the more vulnerable ones. And I do have stories, but I don't really want to focus on that too much. But what you do is you've got these men who are like in the forties and fifties. And they've got this fantasy of being in this four par lesbian relationship. And you've got a repressed gay young person, 20 to 30, in that age range. And they want to have that dominant partner kind of look after them in a way. So there's like this mutual beneficial relationship almost of doing it. But the fact of the matter is you have to get over the fact that that's like somebody three decades older than you and they look disgusting. So in their mind they think that they're sexually entitled to you because of that because you want this, what they can give and all that sort of thing so there's a lot of presumptions on their side um anyway i really don't want to get too much into that because no, but i'm really move, move. off by one of them still and i am writing about that so i will expose it in the future um but as led to shitty behavior but just to quickly go back to <clears throat> the main story um, I'd self-referred at the end of 2013 and I got told it would be 15 months so I went back on the forum <clears throat> and you know testosterone is poison blah 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 and all this shit and I just had this fucking fire up my ass like I need to do this I have to do, you know or CD and just like fucking if you don't listen to that voice in your head your whole family is going to die for some reason right you know it's just stupid well, it makes well, sense. this it's it's going to solve uh, when you talk about the suicidal ideations and uh, no need to delve into that but it'll it'll solve that now now what yeah, I'm asking yeah, yeah. what I'm asking myself listening to your story is is there an element of you that's going to say now this transition is going to cleanse me from all of the things that I've done up yeah. until now about yeah. which I'm humiliated. Yeah, definitely. And um, I went back and they basically, again, I back and forth, fire up my ass, and they were like, oh, there's these 2012, I think it was 2012, 13 or 13, 14, intranum gender protocols. And it was an instruction in, from the NHS. And what it basically was is a guide to treat gender dysphoric patients, right? Um, and it also, in the guidelines, stated that if an individual has two diagnoses from an NHS GP on the approved gender recognition list, which is a long-winded way of saying approved GPs in the NHS who work privately, um, you can um be eligible to start hormones because you've had those assessments but that's what the gender clinic normally do they do assessment and then someone else does an assessment so i'm earning like near minimum wage at the time because at the period one had a pay rise since like 2008 you know so um me i was barely breaking even and uh i'm like how much is it it was like 450 pound and then 50 pound for the petrol to go this 150 mile drive but I knew that it would take about a year to save. And I was like, I can't wait that long, obviously. So I got a payday loan. Do you know what a payday loan is? No. A payday it loan. Is fucking stupid is what it is. It, it's sounds, it sounds like you're indebting yourself for all future earnings. <laughs> for, yeah, for a period so of time. It's a short-term loan with like 3,000% APR. 
right? So the idea is you borrow like say 50 pound for a day and you pay maybe like 30 pence interest. But that's not what happens because it's based off the supremely high APR. I'd got one for 500 pound and that put us in a massive debt because of 3000% APR and I couldn't pay it back straight away. So it just got, anyway, that's beside the point, the payday loan, but but they that's another thing they they prey on the vulnerable um and i was vulnerable and i was desperate so i had me cash and i went up to scotland on march 17th so the psychiatrist she diagnosed me there and then and then i was like can i come back tomorrow and she was like yeah sure why not rather than going back in like so many weeks or whatever so i went back the next day so it was a waste of time we pretty much said the same thing and then i went to see a colleague about 30, 40 miles away. And uh, after those three appointments in those two days, I had a full diagnosis of transsexualism. So I took that to the gender clinic who was still waiting for saying, give me hormones, please, because I can't afford to do it privately. Um, and I would like the NHS to do it. And they're like, well, we haven't formally assessed you. And then I was like, well, look at the interim guidelines. It says you have to, so like, okay. So they give us the blocker in April 2014. And then um, they didn't put us on any, any estrogen or anything for a long time after because they formally assessed us, even though I had these assessments, which were like rushed. And uh, finally, we spot came in 2015 at the gender clinic in January. Are we talking... Oh, sorry, sorry. It was the spot for surgery or for uh, another another diagnosis? It, it's just to be seen at the gender clinic okay. to go in. And that is when she asked, second I walked through the door, have you given any thought of genital reassignment surgery? And I was like, fucking hell. I mean, I don't think so. Um, don't know. But I'd also heard from all the other like trans people that you had to say certain things. And <clears throat> in my head, it was like, well... I really am trans, so I want to be honest with them as possible because if I lie, who benefits? So I didn't do what they said, and I was just very honest, and I was like, I don't think I want surgery. And she was like, um, what I do really want, though, is I want therapy to work through the OCD because it was still really bad at that mm -hmm. point, even though I'd been on the, the blocker now for like eight, nine months at that point. And I, I didn't really notice much difference to the OCD. It was still really bad. So I was like, can I see a therapist here before I make any choice? So I got signed up to see what's called a psychosexual therapist, which is a gender therapist, okay? That basically <laughs> is a gender affirmation therapist. Um, and and gender, gender affirmation means there's no treatment per se other than the treatment in you transition. Are trans. You are trans. Everything is because you're trans. You're trans. So start therapy with that guy in 2015. Uh, I would end up having, I had therapy with him for five years. It was like a hundred sessions with this dude. So he was with us all the time. Um, I clicked with him, you know, he was a, an actual gay guy as well, funnily enough. Um, and by the July 2015, because you see these psychiatrists at the gender clinic like every five, six months. That's normally how, uh, until you get discharged from the service. So July 15 said, right, you've had, you, you've been in therapy now three months. Do you want surgery? And I was like, fucking hell, I, I think so. I guess so. So they started the referral process. Um, and then the referral came through in September of 2015 and I was like, fuck this, I'm not doing this. This is too too soon, I'm gonna cancel it. And the psychiatrist said, yeah, that's fine. Take your time, just wait until you're ready, you know? And I was like, okay then. So I went back to the therapist I was seeing as well and um, we're just working through things. And the same thing happened in 2016, got referred, canceled it. And then in 2017, um, keep in mind, I've been seeing the therapist for ages. Uh, I had one of me six monthly checkups with a psychiatrist and she said, okay, you know, you've been in the service now for like two years. You've refused surgery multiple times. If you don't want surgery, we'll discharge you because we are a medical service here to, 
you know, we're not a mental health service. That's what they said. And I'm like, are you okay? But whatever. Um, so I'd kind of swallowed me um, pride and or whatever. And I decided, no, um, go ahead with the discharge them. Fine. Go do it. And that's how it was going. <laughs> and then the next day I had a gender therapy session. Um, can't remember what the hell you said it was, but it sparked something within us that made us really panic. And at the end of that th session, I rang the psychiatrist back to start the referral process. Did you want to ask a question? Yes. The, the, uh, the session that you had that re reinvigorated the desire, is that with the gay psych, the gay doctor who you've been seeing yeah. for a long time? This is Wasn't my a doctor, by the way, just a gender therapist. Okay. Okay. Um, and by that, the, 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 the I didn't mean to, the, the gay was only relevant just so I could know which, which doctor we're talking about. It's but... very relevant. It is extremely relevant for a gay man to do this to another gay man. Well, th this is, this is one of the, one of my underlying theories and views is that th this whole trans mo movement is, it's fundamentally misogynistic and fundamentally homophobic where they're basically yeah. saying, you're not good enough being gay. There's something wrong with you being gay. You're actually trans. That's the solution to your being gay as though being gay is a problem. Yeah. Where I was going with this doctor is, in the, in the, you've had a lot of sessions. So some people could say, well, doctor's trying to talk you out of it. Uh, am I right in viewing these sessions as trying to talk you into it? Yes, definitely. Like, and I've got me medical notes to prove it. <laughs> so, um, and which is why I'm taking them to court and we'll get to that bit. Yep. That's, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I smile with the, the only thing that's going to end no, is, is oh, yeah. lawsuits. Yeah. So okay. anyway, yeah, so it you, is. You, this guy who's been, you've been with him for uh, how, like months, if not, over a year now, when you At say that 100 point, sessions? it was two years and two months okay. or something. And so, that. and this is like, look, if I, I, I'm seeing this through sick and sordid perspective, that it's like, oh, we're getting there, we're getting there a little bit more. Oh, back there, he, you know, Richie's not yet ready, comes back. Let's try it a little again. Um, and now he says, oh shit, if, if Richie's out of the system, I lose this. I, I don't know what financial benefit this individual has other than... I don't know. I think there was a bit of a... There was definitely helping at the start, but it quickly did become very much codependent, I think, too. And he wasn't a doctor, too. He wasn't a psychiatrist. And this was... guy says, look, if, if, if I lose Richie, if that's it. If you're gone and you say, no, we're gone, that's it. Well, now I've got to say something to reinvigorate this. I don't know. I, d I don't know if that was it. I think it was just, I, th I don't think it was that conscious. But basically, I had the session the next day, fire got lit up in my house, and I suddenly had it in my head that, um, you know, if you don't, you're going to lose the chance in the future, and you might regret not doing it now, which is bizarre. Um, anyway, so I ring the psychiatrist back that afternoon saying, please refer me, and the... Uh, process started again um only this time i'd surrendered and i'd bought in and i was completely bought in um i the, you know the psychiatrist told us because one of me had lots of fears and concerns about bleeding which is ironic um and regret which is uh, even more ironic um and these were all like brushed aside there was no in-depth conversations with them about this is what this is what happens in surgery these are the side effects. These are the potential complications. These are the potential benefits. None of that. It was, you would be amazed how the skin can repurpose and repair itself. Like planting the, that's what psychiatrist said was, implanting the idea that my brain would somehow create the rest of the vagina out of it, if that makes sense. But the way it was pitched here is like, I'm a crazy person and I'm unwell. And you're telling me that my brain after surgery is just going to fix the damage and make it look how I want it. Okay, it, sounds good. You know, and, and we, we've only started seeing these videos now, you know, TikTok for all its toxicness. Uh, there are D trans, for whatever you want to call it, people coming out now saying, geez, I didn't know that I'd have to do all these daily procedures. I didn't know that there was a risk of, of compacting hair. I didn't know that. I, and, and they're sobbing about it while saying they don't regret it. And it's quite obvious that they cannot admit that they regret it because it's it's sort of an irreversible thing. And, and the only way to deal with it is to pretend. There's a few factors going on there, though, David. You know, you've got people. Sorry for interrupting. Don't worry, too. please. Um, you know, if you if you regret it, 
and you're public about it, people are going to jump on you saying you regret it. And then all of a sudden you are now being used by the other side, as they say. So there's a lot of like, people generally don't want to hurt anyone else, but they, in doing so, they won't allow themselves to feel pain. Um, and the pain just comes out and the words, you know, the words say one thing, but the face is something else, as you said, they're just crying and I understand that feeling. I really, really do. Um, but I, I don't want to be that, that person that does the social media video of crying about what it is. I'll tell people how it is, but I'm not going to sit and sob, you know, anyway, where were we, David? Uh, we were talking about them telling you it's going to be all hunky dory. We're not telling you, we're not going to warn you about the long risks of this procedure, how Frankenstein Frankensteinian it, it might be what you're going to have to do for the rest of your life. Yeah. And they say, it's all, it's all for hunky dory. You're going to do it next day. You're going to be a woman and you're going to be happy for the rest of your life. Like Pretty Cinderella. Much. Yeah. So I've had friends who were having the procedure at the same time and, one friend was like, you know, the research shows you look at like four decades of extra quality life and all the shit, all these statements would come out. And um, I remember talking to somebody who I'd heard on the grapevine, it hadn't went 100% well. And I was dying to have a conversation with them. And I said, is it worth it? Is it good? She went, it's okay. That that was as much as no sensation, depth loss, infections, urinary issues, pain. That's all she could muster. It's okay. Didn't want to say it. Didn't want to say how bad it was. No one would. My friend who had even worse complications than I did, who even drove me back from surgery, and they had their surgery yeah, before, wouldn't tell us. No one tells each other. Um, even I didn't tell anyone for a few years after. It's so difficult to do it because... When you're in that initial stage of recovery, you think you're in the healing process and everything's going to get better, but it doesn't, it never gets better. It's, it just doesn't. So you, you kind of barter with yourself. Like I'll give it time. I'll give it time. You know, and it's just the healing. It's everyone says it takes a couple of years for it to be right. So I'll wait then. And it never does. Um, but we're skipping ahead. Just go back a bit. So the year the year um so you make the decision um and they tell you it's going to be all right how, how do you get from there to the to the surgery table so that was 2017 and i'd kind of bought into the idea and i was desperate to have these discussions with everyone and everyone was really positive about it no one yeah. said anything negative about it. no one and i was like right then i guess this is it so i was quite happy um in 2017 i, I thought this is it this is all i need to do and just live the rest of my life you know um cool excellent and i went to the pre-surgery assessment in about the end of 2017 i think it was just one and uh it was a bizarre the most bizarre experience and you would almost think nothing was happening you would think like we're going for like something as mundane as like a swab or something like it was so relaxed like not in the like making you feel welcome it was like blase so i go sorry i'm just gonna say this is in it's actually enraging me the way you describe this now because this is like i went in for a ganglion cyst i went in for a, a testicular torsion and i'm like okay well, what's the expertise of the doctor who's going to who's going to fix up these things and the and these are relatively simple procedures what this is like, I, I'd call it brain surgery, but it's almost more complex than brain surgery. They're physically altering male genitalia to, uh, I mean, the, the word is neo-vagina that people are using, a, a female genitalia. Who the hell's doing this? What's their trade? How has it been a long, uh, around for long enough that anybody has, it, or are they just literally, I don't want to use a bad, like inflammatory descriptions, but are they just, are they just butcher doctors who are just going in and doing the best they can with the technology they have at the time which is manifestly insufficient to do anything because it might be physically impossible sorry for the rant is that is that you're going in on the table and they're doing this to you and they're just saying oh it's just it's just an in and out day procedure well it it, it was just the whole atmosphere but in terms of these there are definitely butchers by the way you can see it in their eyes and like 
um, I don't want to get you in trouble by naming individuals, but there are certain people who run TikToks and they venerate surgery and you can see it in their eyes that there's something missing that from that human. It's a little bit psycho eyes and they're loving it. And the equally, this one individual who I'm, I'm thinking of, they also show off their lavish uh, lifestyle and yachts and shit. And it's like, well, obviously this is very profitable too. Um, and there are definitely sycophants and psychopaths who do surgery, but my surgeon, I didn't, I didn't know because I didn't talk to him long enough to to get that vibe. The vibe I got from him was, he was probably high function, high functioning like autism. I would say maybe because the pre op assessment was the strangest experience ever of any surgery I've ever had because I didn't do it alone. There were two other patients with me. So you get seen in threes, not one-on-one, -on -one, you get seen in threes. So I go in this waiting room and I get called around to another secret waiting room and there's these two trans people there with me and I'm thinking, what's going on here? We're going to get seen one at a time. No, we got all pulled into this room together. The surgeon sat on his keyboard facing, like he's like, he's on the other end of the room and he's facing sideways. So his head is like, like, you know, we're over there if that makes sense. And he's just blanket, just staring at your screen, making notes. In between him and us is the head nurse. Now, I know I had that rant earlier about how all nurses are great. She ain't. She was a bitch, uh, like a proper bitch. And I'm not just saying that, like she was, she would slander patients. She would make, like, she would always, at the earliest opportunity, and I know other people, she would tell them stories. And like, you know, she would just, she just, I didn't feel like she was a nice person anyway. And she definitely treat us all like we were retarded. And I shouldn't say that word, but we kind of were to do what we did. But anyway, um, basically, um, I'm in this room. He's on the other side and she's in the middle. And I've got these two other trans people beside us. And she pulls up this big fucking book, right? Big, huge hardback book. Opens this book and starts slowly turning the pages. And on each page was a collage of vaginas, right? That's it. Just vaginas. And the whole purpose was to show us that every vagina was different. And these weren't surgery pictures of people who had surgery. These were pictures of women's vaginas. And the whole point was to show us that every vagina is different. And they were not surgical photos. And I'm fucking, I'm confused as fuck, like, for, um you know, for the majority of this pre-op is taken up with this book, right? And it, it was the most bizarre thing ever. And I'm, I'm like confused. And then after you get each like um, two minutes with a surgeon. So what he does is he had a look at your area to see how much hair removal you had. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. And that's it. That was like, that was the level of dialogue I had with my surgeon. And because it was so casual, I was like, well, I guess this is so common, you know, they're putting within three at a time The, you know, she kind of sounded when I, because any question I had for the surgeon was intercepted by the head nurse. So I would be like, I would say his name and she would be like answering it instead. So I didn't even have that one on one with him. Um, and then I had me time alone and he was like, yeah, you've had enough hair removal, we'll book you in. And then a few months later, I went down and uh, I had surgery. And so, so if I may stop you there, actually, the, the day with the three was not the day of the surgery. That's just pre-op. So the pre-operative assessment. And, and, I, and I'm not asking this to be glib and there's no, but when they're showing you the pictures of the vaginas, it's not like, this is it what yours crazy. might it's just to say like they all look different and I was, and, and, and you don't know what yours is going to look like, or is it which one pick the one that you want to most look like? Is, no, it was, it was, it was, they all look different. Okay. Um, this, you describe this, it sounds like a horror movie to me. Like it, it, it it's, yeah, it is. it's pretty fucked up. Okay. So now this happens and then, and then three months later, so they schedule the actual surgery. Do they tell so, you how long, how long in the hospital for? Sorry. Yeah. So they said you would have seven days in the hospital and surgery would be two and a half hours. So I got wheeled in at 10 o'clock, but I came out at half three in the afternoon. 
um, because I had a severe hemorrhage and I lost a lot of blood. Recorded in surgery, it was 1600 milliliters, but I know I lost a lot more after in bed because you have like drains and shit. But the surgeon refused to give us a blood transfusion for five days. And I didn't find out till after that. This is all to do with stats, by the way, because if they leave a couple of days, it doesn't come up on their stats for blood transfusions. So I had it five days after, and the nurses were all like saying, you need a blood transfusion, you need a blood transfusion, because I was in and out of consciousness. So I could barely remember the first five days, because I was unconscious in a high fever, and uh, I, w I wasn't well. And then they give us two units of blood, and then I walk up, and I was like, whoa, I'm awake now. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm now aware that I'm in hospital recovering from this major surgery, but it's also on the day the packing comes out, which is the bandaging inside. And I didn't have that like mental preparation. And uh, the first time he did it, um, he took out the packaging and the, the bandaging and had a mirror. And I just tried not to gasp. I tried my best not to gasp. And it was just such a fucking horrible sight, man. Like, I just can't explain it. It was. Yeah. Horrible. Um, just looked. It literally looked like. Literally looked like somebody taking a hatchet, like not even a sharp one, and just fucking went at you. That's what it looked like. Did not resemble anything. And then me sutras, which are the scar lines on the side of the thing, they popped open, and that left a dent. I had massive urinary issue issues, and even though I had a catheter, I needed the medical staff to help empty it for the first like days and because i had like blood loss i had to stay in hospital longer as well so it wasn't like the seven days um and i went home with a catheter i couldn't pee i was in a lot of pain and obviously i had this wound that was uh popping up and got severely infected um i started to deal with the infections i couldn't piss probably for about three or four months i drove myself back down to brighton from newcastle which is where i live which is about 350 miles because no accident and emergency our doctors will touch touch it so it has to be the original hospital and for me it was in brighton which is 350 miles away so i had um, a minor procedure there in the august following because i had the original in may and then i had a revision surgery in uh january 2019 to fix the labia and the urinary stuff because uh, I've got um, urethral constriction which is like taking a straw and bending the straw basically and you know it's hard to extract stuff out of so um after I'm, I'm skipping over a, a few key pits here so three months after surgery what well, because I was like, I was bed bound for ages. I'd started back at the gender therapist sessions. And I said to him, three months after surgery, I've fucking made a terrible mistake here. This shouldn't have done this. This has been the worst thing I've ever done. And he said, you've just had um, a major surgery and you've had anesthetic. And anesthetic is known to lower your serotonin levels. You've got OCD. This is an OCD rumination. So... What we'll do is um we'll, we'll we talked about it there and then and that was and then i accepted that and then i came back a few weeks later and i said the same thing and i kept coming back and coming back and if coming i may back. ask you an ocd rumination i'm not familiar with the term rumination is that just a recurrence or a manifestation it's of like, OCD? yeah yeah so like an, an example of a rumination would be am i going to hell it's an impossible question to answer right okay. Like it, whether you believe it or not, but you, you there's no way you could you, you could know, right? So you can get like religious ruminations um, that can be really intrusive, where you worry constantly, 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 and it's like it's it's went beyond your religious belief, and it's now an obsessive rumination that you can't yeah. dislodge. And mine at the time I got told was I've I'm regretting it because I'm having problems. I, I this is just the absolute, um, is it catch 22 uh, irony is that they're saying the regret is an OCD rumor, uh, rumor, rumor it, rumination, but the idea that you have to become uh, a woman is not an OCD rumination. That's I mean, right. Yeah. And that's why I got really pissed at them. And then 
that just said uh, I kept coming back session after session because they were winding down to discharges because I had surgery and there was nothing else for them to do, obviously, because they got the customer and that. And um, in the end, they were just like, right, we'll refer you on for OCD treatment. <laughs> and then uh, I got referred for OCD treatment in 2019, and I'm still waiting for, like, the rest of it, and it's 2023 now. So the, uh, Now, I'm, I don't want to feel like I'm – that there's any element of me that's trying to get you mad at the situation listening to you explain this makes me angrier than i thought i could have ever gotten at what i was already angry about by what i thought was exploitation of mentally vulnerable individuals and you're you're an adult now there's people out there who are going to say you got what you asked for because you're an adult you should know better uh i think that's a very callous and short-sighted way of seeing this whereas this is there are people with mental issues who need treatment and help not exploitation and whatever that whatever the doctors did it, it's it, now there ha, there is the silver lining to all this is in that you seem you're dealing with it and you're using it to pivot for good the question though i mean i always say is how, how do you how do you get over this how do you deal with this but before we even get there, just the surgery itself. So you hemorrhage because presumably they didn't clamp down whatever veins they have to clamp down properly before they make certain incisions, certain severing. And is that is that a cat? Yeah, it is. I'm just let's see. Let, let's see it. Let's see the cat. Well, All this right. is an animal that's going to distract us from from the rage it's of the moment. Room now, because I pushed him away. I'm okay, fair. Well, You'll come back. You'll come. Okay, back. I got I got my dog underneath. I got two there. They're both I've hanging around. So. Very nice. Okay, so so you, you hemorrhage out, which which itself is a problem. Uh, you're 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 in and out of consciousness, and then you wake up out of sedation. Is that a moment that you can never forget? Yeah, it was. It was when I first saw everything because I didn't. There was that moment when I stood up in the full length mirror, but the moment for me was when. I was in bed still and I couldn't get out of bed and you had the handheld mirror and it was like that because I couldn't control when I was going to see it. You just like shoved it in my face and it was just there. And I was just like, <gasps> like it wasn't a, oh, that's great. You know what I mean? It was like a fuck. Like it was a very visceral, like something's wrong. You know, when something's wrong and you're like, and you just, you just gasp and I just, and I, as I was gasping, I had to stop myself because I was like, I don't want to show them that I'm disappointed. And then I, then I had like this, you know, it's really, really kind of fucked up at that time because it's too early to acknowledge it. But I just said to myself, what the fuck have I done? What have I done? Like, what have I done? I just couldn't answer it for ages. And then for four years, I was pretty much like that. And... um last year i was just like well fuck this shit um because I, I kind of thought you know i fucked my life i'm just gonna like self-delete because i've I had a run and i failed um but so i was like well i've got nothing to lose i may as well tell people how every how fucked up this is and then uh everyone was like I didn't expect it to go this way at all. And I like I was totally anonymous at the start. I had no intention of being public. I had no intention of suing. All I wanted to do was just tell people how fucking awful it was to warn others mainly. And then I was just like, and as that was happening in really like sort of the years after surgery, I started like becoming a bit bitter. And what started everything was I started Googling my own complications I was having and I was finding like so much shit that I'd never seen before. Like Reddit boards that were deleted and they only exist on archives, like SRS. I can't remember what the original one was, but it was like surgeries that had gone wrong in SRS. And if you go on any of these like subreddits on the Reddit for surgery, especially for male and female, well, say male and female, I'll get onto that language game in a second. Um, what you'll find is everyone who lists the complication has deleted their account. It's like the most common user in our MTF surgeries is a user called deleted <laughs> because everyone makes a post and deletes it. And that's what happens. And it's like, there were so many people who had the same thing. And I just, I was just, I couldn't believe that. Because I thought it was just my own dumb fucking look or my own dumb mistake that this was the way it was. 
And what really, really pissed us off is I started seeing all these people who were like just being silenced and they couldn't talk about it. Everything was being contained. All their doubts were being managed by the community, by the doctors, and they couldn't even feel grief for the fuck up. No one was allowed to say, shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have been allowed to do this. And it was like, if I had walked in like this at the beginning with zero like mental health stuff, right, that would be a different story. But I went in, told them everything, absolutely everything. Like I did not hold back. Um, all the worst shit. And then what they did was like, yeah, nod, nod, nod. And when it does go wrong, they're like, ah, yeah, this is because you've got this condition. You, Of course you can't regret it. No one regrets it. Don't be that. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's pretty much where it landed me. And then as I started speaking out, um, people were like, yeah, have you ever thought about suing? And I was like, not really, because I kind of like, I did it, you know what I mean? I'm an adult and all that shit. And because the narrative was, you know, adults can do whatever they like. So that's the message, folks. If you know somebody mentally ill, they're allowed to do whatever the fuck they like, you know. Well, and, and 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 not just that, but from the other side, is like they're allowed to do whatever they like. Yes, but doctors are not necessarily authorized to do whatever the, uh, a a mentally yeah. unwell patient tells them to do to them. That's 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 the other side of the argument. And these these guys are. They've got a great financial incentive to continue doing this. It's become a, a bloody industry in the last 10 years. Um, now, we, as you as you come out and start to anonymously talk about your regret and then publicly, I know the answer to the question, but you start not just, you start getting a lot of pushback and hate and, and vitriol from the people who had lauded you as a hero for going through with what you did in the first place. Yeah, so I was... I was a little bit of a preacher too. I wasn't like a social media preacher. When I say preacher, I'm talking about the church of trans. Okay. So I was very, very, um, I was in an organization, she would say, and I did damage in my own way. And I was very much selling this to everyone. And eventually I would sell like this sort of like calm and polite and well-spoken um, side of the movement. You know, it was like, the gay side of the movement, they're all very polite and non-threatening. And it's like, how could anyone, you know, say that you're a bad person? I've just heard you speak about all your difficulties because I would talk about how hard my life is, but I would snipe all the inconvenient details, you know, like the fact that I actually had quite a good childhood. You wouldn't hear that, would you? Um, yeah, there was marital problems in the house, but whose parents didn't have fucking issues, right? But I had everything, <laughs> None, my parents didn't, abusers they didn't tell us i was a piece of shit they didn't shout at us or scream at us they didn't do any of that i had a good i had a good life i really did i just had mental health issues and i was gay that was it um and i'd kind of retconned that and changed everything and all the instances that kind of were more representative of my self as a person and an emerging soul soft sensitive bit flamboyant a little bit high attention, whatever deficit disorder thing. Okay, cool. Um, and and that's kind of all it, it should have been. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going off. I'm no, going no, Dory. Off. And you're talking about uh, the, well, I, I actually I appreciate what you're talking about now. Is now you're you're retroactively, retrospectively looking at what you have done and the role you've played in this. I presume when you're when you're preaching the Church of Trans. This is prior to the actual surgery and and not post, or is it post as well? Both. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and just, just Richard, just you know, like I, I'm not judging you. I don't think many people with an open mind are going to judge you because you're in a position now where you have to internalize and rationalize and and uh, and, and digest what you deep down know is your own mistake. And and I, I'm maybe putting words in your mouth, but I hope I'm not. And one of the easiest ways to do it is by doubling down and pretending doing your best to make it look like it wasn't a mistake. Yeah. And and these are defensive sort of um actions but uh so don't also, I mean you don't you you don't need you should not feel guilty about this although it is very open to have the the retrospective analysis of your own behavior. Thanks David. Um I also think that a lot of trans people and this extends to detrans personalities too have um 
I'm trying to choose my words politely and care carefully, but I would you, say you, you, you don't you don't have to. I, j I just yeah, you don't have to. We are all narcissists. We're raging narcissists. It takes a very narcissist temperament for you to change your reality for mine, for a start. And a narcissist struggles saying that they're wrong and that they've made a mistake. I am not a the epitome of a narcissist. I just have narcissistic tendencies that I've worked very hard on over the years to to battle down. But there is an element of narcissism with the trans movement. There is. It's crazy. You want an example? Fucking Dylan Mulvaney and um, Jeffrey that, Marsh. <laughs> Jeffrey Marsh. That fucker. Um, and you know, the, all of us, even detransitioners, are to some degree because here we are sprouting about all our pain and stuff and expecting people to feel sorry for us when really, um, cause the argument is, oh, you know, you would have screamed at us 10 years ago. And I was like, no, I, wouldn't. I don't scream at people now. So why would I scream then as well? I was, a, I was mental, but I wasn't like at all piece of shit. You know what I mean? I wouldn't like do any of the, there's this fantasy. Some people have that every day transition or like all, trans people are like rage and scream and and like the ones that you see on the clips on youtube and that and like all the really cringy ones and most of them aren't most of them are like damaged and traumatized and they don't they don't do any of that and they're very like they don't stick up for themselves most of the time and yeah but there is narcissism in the movement and it's extraordinarily diff difficult for a narcissist to say i've made a mistake which is why the it takes a lot of personal growth and normally it comes from reality like the trauma of just whatever you've been through is normally enough to bring you back but also time um women on average detransition after about 5.5 to 6 years of medical treatment whereas males it's about 7.5 to 8.5 years which is why in 2019, 2020, this is when all the female detransitioners started speaking because there was a boom in 2014, 15, which is where a lot of the modern transitioners kind of all trace back to. Um, and then obviously you've had the Gen Z courts since like the TikTok cohort and the lockdown cohort, um, which are just more stages of getting it to the ultimate level, which is to get it embedded in policy school, et cetera, which is where we're at now. Um, and the cohorts were just the way to get there. Um, and we're at that, we're at ground zero now where it, it is literally, the policies are everywhere and the need scrubbed um, off the systems, off, you, a, it doesn't matter if it's a small organization, they're everywhere and they're, they're well mean and but they're just their own interpretations of law and it all reinforces this identity um, narrative that people can beat each other over the head with. But it's interesting thing about the narcissism. I, I'm, I'm not sure I would, well, about your narcissism because you don't strike me as being narcissistic at all. You strike, me, well, you strike me as being quite amazingly introspective. But like I, I, I said it before, like there can be nothing more narcissistic than someone telling you how you have to refer to them when talking about them to a third party. With the whole he, she, me, they pronouns, uh, it's not even about how you deal with them one on one. It's what they're telling you to refer to them as when you're talking about them to somebody else. What can be more narcissistic and 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 dominating, controlling behavior than trying to control someone else's speech with other people when you're not there? Um, I, I and I don't. So just so this doesn't look one sided, um, let me try to steel man the flip side. Have you met in your journey any people who have gone through this and are wildly happy with their their new body parts? Yeah. If you have, um, do, do you feel that you're in the minority or the majority or the unspoken majority of those who have done the, the, like, the ultimate? Because you got uh, the Dylan Mulvaney's who, I don't, whatever, they, whatever they do, they, they haven't made that irreversible decision. And so it's very easy for them to encourage others and, and, and be you know, all smiley biley about it when they haven't done what is ultimately a very irreversible act. Those who have gone through it, who are sufficiently self-reflective, I mean, what, what's the tendency that you're noting uh, having been in the community? Um, my biggest observation is there is a huge degree of medical negligence occurring, whether or not 
surgery was right or wrong doesn't matter i don't care if it's right or wrong for somebody the problem is the surgeries itself and the complications that they're causing these aren't one-offs these every, I, I can't remember which one it was I read the other day, but there was um, an article that came out about the pulse up complications, very recent study, and it was like, you, you're you not just guaranteed to have a complication, it would be rare for somebody to not have at least three, right? And that, to me, is like, you know, they might say, oh, it's just minor stuff like bleeding and um, what they call granulation tissue, which is scar tissue and dead skin on the inside becoming like infected and stuff. As if just it's small, like, small, well, small issues yeah. they, they can only cause i don't know blood infection sepsis or whatever but yeah, yeah. yeah just small issues you know and then um ever like i don't know anyone who hasn't had an issue um of my close friends in person over the years who have transitioned um picking names out of six friends two of us have got sensation the rest have got nothing and we're told it's one in six that don't get sensation. And I mean, nothing, zero, um, it's gone. Again, I'm not asking to, to, for, you know, to be nosy. When you say um, sensation, numbness or Everything. lack? So numbness, like- Nothing, you can't even feel it with your finger. Because they like, said they severed nerves going down yeah. and, and the nerves just don't work. They don't reattach and it's numb. Yes, and there's a reason for that. So your body's got a, like a natural response to shock and trauma for obviously all the you know like i think humans in a current anatomical form have been around for what was like 250 300 years i think is the current estimate um and you know throughout our evolution we've had limbs getting lost we've been getting bones broken and all sorts so one of the natural responses to any sort of trauma is for your body to cut the nerves it's like dead kill the nerves this is too much, something's happening. It's the only natural response for your body to do. It doesn't know what else to do, which makes perfect sense, which is why women who have mastectomies for transition have got numb chests, right? They're all mostly totally numb across the, the chest, they can't feel a thing because they've just went through this very, very um, evasive procedure. And someone like me, you know, it's not just removing, it's then we're going to move shit around inside too because I didn't even know that, like, you can't probably have anal sex after because the, and this is going to sound gross, right? So if you imagine, like, your your anal passage and you've got your your, your prostate sort of sitting, like, on the, on the canal, as it were, in order to get, like, to achieve orgasm, what normally happens is they move the, the put a, uh, an extra canal in, which is the neovaginal canal, but in doing so, it kind of moves the prostate over. So you can't get the same stimulation through anal, it has to be through the front. And if you can't pleasure yourself through the front, you've lost that completely, right? So not only do they take away your sexual function from your genitals, they take it from the back too, which for gay people is quite important. Um, and uh it's the little things that don't quite uh tell you with that and obviously i was i was in a i was in a fantasy land uh, at that point i was totally away with the fairies in 2017 i was like yeah this is gonna solve everything it's gonna be great because it, i said no and i've been convinced and every, all the professionals are saying this is the right thing so. I, it's it's something you mentioned it for and i've never even thought of it until you mentioned it um that aspect where where it's not just i don't know like like i we're we're, we're playing god in in a, or not we these doctors are playing god or frankenstein in that they say well, we'll just we'll make it look like a a woman's parts and i say that without judgment men are men women are women and but for you know certain genetical anomalies like an extra chromosome whatever there's separate issues let's just make it look like that and it, it, it you can't reposition the male anatomy when you're trying to redesign it to make it look like female anatomy and I had never even thought about what impact that would have, and especially the. Yeah, I, I, I'm not gay. It's but I understand what the sexual preferences and practices of gay people are. And never even thought. You don't about. have to be gay to enjoy butt sex. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, I'm uh, my my chat knows I'm a you know keep a schmeckle in the pants type guy. Like, but no, I never never even thought of that. And sure as hell know that they never mentioned that to you. And when I, when I interviewed Chloe Cole, 
they never mentioned what would be the long-term impacts of a, of a double mastectomy on, on a 15 year old. Um, so to, when you, so of the people, you know, two have no sensation, two are lucky enough to have sensation. The one thing we're, we're, we're told the mantra is that, would you rather have a, a dead X or a, a living trans X? And I'm saying that just because it goes either way. Uh, would you rather have a, a, de a dead boy versus a living girl or a dead girl versus a living boy, which is what they said for Chloe Cole. And I hate asking the question because I don't like putting the juju out in the universe. Have you known people who post trans have succumbed to the to the to the crushing reality of what they've of, of the fear of what they've done and have decided to self delete? Yeah. How often does that if I how often does that happen? Rare. Um to be honest, I think a lot of people go into some cost fallacy and I think a lot of trans trans day of remembrance i think a lot of that is regret based rather than transphobia as they'll say because you read a lot of these entries and it's like tdolivesmatter.org or something if you want to check it out yourself and what they do is they'll list the reason for suicide and stuff and you'll see it so time and time again person had surgery and then it will give you some spiel about how transphobic the world is for them and or how long the waiting times are. And it's like, you know, the whole better than a dead kid thing and, you know, the, the waiting times at the gender clinic is killing people. And it's like, can we just address the elephant in the room that there is not a person going around killing these people? It's themselves. He basically saying, we need to protect you from yourself by giving to, by fulfilling all your de demands. You're basically suicide baiting um with you know with full authority um i didn't suicide bait but i understand a lot of people who have and why they did it and the most one of the worst things when you come like out of the realization and stuff is just realizing all the bullshit that you said um to yourself to others now it could have been far worse my situation i could have had a social media i could have done youtube videos i could have you know, I could have went had a viral video, and I was definitely, possibly within that category at, at one point in my transition. But I didn't. But for a lot of people that do, they do have some cringy shit that they're terrified that's going to get dragged up, and it's so hard, as well, when you, all your friends and all your interests are trans because all of a sudden everything's an allegory for being trans. You're like a politician who does something related to being trans it's just trans 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 you lose your individuality and you just become a member don't want to say it. it's a cult but it has a lot of the hallmarks of a cult um it's not a cult but it's a cult <laughs> and, and and a cult that's be, i mean i i don't understand the I, I know people from the marxist divide society perspective say I, it's a cult for a reason now and media hypes it up doctors have made an industry of it um and what better way to cull a future generation than by effectively sterilizing the next generation, as many as you can. There's a lot of theories as to how and why this has become a social uh, phenomenon. One thing's for um, certain, it has. So it, there's two things that have happened. You've had the affirmation model being reintroduced after being dead for 30 years because it got... A lot of people don't realize that the gender affirmation model that is based today, the affirm by all means, don't question, that was put to rest in 1979 by the US's first gender clinic, the John Hopkins University. Um, and they'd basically said, doesn't work, stop. So they stopped all the surgery procedures. And then all the activists in 79 got very annoyed at that. And they started WPATH, which started releasing their own guidelines and for some reason people started listening to them and then in 2011 they released the seventh version of those guidelines which basically said forget all the questioning forget the safeguards you affirm if somebody says the trans the trans and then you also had that with social media and it's social media plus suck seven which is standards of care seven that is what's created this Everything else, out what you're seeing, at, like on the sidelines with like these TikTok doctors and that, they're opportunists. They didn't drive this. They're just benefiting from it. And there are a lot of people benefiting from this. But it also, 
add it if I'm putting me um tin foil hat on and I'm running out of tin foil, um I would have to say that this is very adequately timed around the time of the financial crash of 2008 um, and the Occupy Wall Street movement when there was a big move towards um, talking about how like wealth was managed. I'm not a, a commie on you know, that bullshit, right? I'm just saying that this was the conversation that was happening, you know, like why should all these big bankers and all these millions, right? Um, and then all of a sudden you've got identity politics out of fucking nowhere and sucks seven. I don't know. I would be interested to see what investigators of the future dig up. I well, really I, 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 there's a lot of people who think I, I've noticed this trend the, uh, mostly on TikTok. And there's a lot of people saying, you know, TikTok is a Chinese designed app to destroy yes. American society. I uh, once thought that was a lot crazier than I think it is today. Um, but you know the, the the social what is it called? There's a there's a phenomenon. It was a social it, reward scheme. Really. Uh, no, it's like when something becomes a craze, basically, like like the Virgin Suicides, where it becomes a con, a social contagion. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. This has become a, it's become a social contagion. Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, there are there are doctors who are doing this, and look, I, I think it's I think in many cases. Um, it is it should be sanctionable and what i was going to say like, that was what i was going to say that you talk about the sock seven the standards of care seven but people also forget that this gender dysphoria or gender dysmorphia i forget i, I always get those two terms mixed up it's been in the, the dsm manual for for decades and the idea now that you would treat what is a diagnosable mental disorder and i say that without judgment the idea that you would treat this mental disorder by catering to it as opposed to say like someone with schizophrenia who thinks that they are uh, an alien, well, you wouldn't go and allow them to perform surgery on themselves to make them look like an alien. Um, but then people say, well, gender is fundamentally different than schizophrenia. It's a, it, it is a diagnosable mental disorder that has been in the DSM one, two, three, four, five, since that, since that manual has been around. And the idea that responsible care is affirming care is catering to it and not um, avoiding it at all costs. I can't really think of, I can think of circumstances where someone is of sound mind and says, "I said I just want I, I want massive like you know quadruple D boobs." Okay, not something I would do. I wanna I wanna do this. Can imagine that? Not in the majority of circumstances, and certainly not with freaking children. Hmm. Which I guess brings us into the lawsuit, uh, our, our, Richie. I, um, well, I don't I, I didn't know about it before we started talking. Are you suing anybody? Oh, yeah, I'm trying. Um, so I am. I've been in this legal process for quite a few months. About five or six months now and it grinds very very slowly so where i'm at at the moment is no one's people have sued for medical negligence before but no one's ever sued for this no one's ever said i don't think i was trans to begin with i think it was just mental no one would dare do that because it's like giving up your trans identity and all that sort of shit and then admitting you're wrong and blah 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 no one wants to do that and and I was just like, well, fuck it. I, I've got gender dysphoria in their rules, but in my head, it's all these different things that could have been threat in isolation. Um, so anyway, yes, is the short answer. I've been in the process for about six months. And what we're doing is we're trying to find out, is this something that can be sued for? <laughs> like, obviously, the medical negligence of the surgery is another matter completely. So there's several vectors going in. So you've got the challenge of the affirmation model and you've got the would another doctor, surgeon do anything different given the scenario if I was their patient, given everything that's happened. And if the answer is, yeah, we'll probably would have done the same thing, no case. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to find out at the minute. But I suspect because of all the red flags that that won't be the case. And I'm hopeful. Um, right now everything's pro bono, like um, so you're not paying anything. Um, and the person who it's went to to see if it can legally be challenged is somebody very high up in the courts. Um, I don't want to say who it is exactly, but it's like uh, what you would call a QC, which is Queen's like Queen's Council. Yeah, yeah. So the the top of the top of the top, um, and they decide if this can be put forward. So if they say yes. Let's fucking go. Um, um, otherwise, uh, the well, I don't know if you know the answer offhand. Statute of limitations in Britain, three years. Okay. So, I after I 
um started experiencing regret i first brought it up like 2019 um and i was like i'm i'm gonna sue you you're a bunch of bastards you've misdiagnosed us but they managed it and all that shit but it still has been over three years so they have to apply for what's called section 33 limitation extension which is to get that three-year rule changed to five or ten which is allowable but it depends on the circumstance it's all to do with when you realized and stuff like that and how it was managed so it's like if you said to somebody i am i'm really pissed off that i've done something wrong and then they said no 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 this isn't like that you you fucking mental mate remember go off and have your treatment that's not the, the it's not as if i've lost my qualification it's a very there's a lot of like coercion and management there so we'll see what happens um there is the off chance they might just say uh you know even with the limitations aside it could be that the affirmation model in place meant that everyone else would have done the same thing therefore is it wrong so there's a lot of uh, complications and also me surgeon fucking died last year didn't he the cheeky bastard right um <laughs> what bit i gotta what ha do you know how he died yeah, covid or some shit i think it was like uh he was 76 years old i didn't know his age at all he was like 72 when he did my surgery and i knew he, i was like yeah you're a bit white haired and that but they don't do any competency tests for like 70 plus year old surgeon <laughs> and no seriously they should they yeah, you hold, hold your hands out. How steady are your hands before? Um... I have to know something, but this guy. But the thing is, in that year, that was like one of the last years he did surgery. And there's a lot of people he fucked up in that year. And I think it was because he was at the end of his career and he just didn't give a fuck. Uh, um, the the uh, Chloe Cole is suing in the in in the states. She's suing the doctors, and and the, the, it's an interesting thing. Like, first of all, you want to avoid the statute of limitations issues. You might have arguments, but you, you don't want to argue over the procedural admissibility before you get to argue over the substance. Uh, but she's taking the angle that you know there was absence of consent because they didn't give anybody, um, it, they didn't give anybody sufficient information to make informed consent. Like, if they say you might bleed out. It's going to take like if they had forewarned you about all of the the risks, the likelihood of even having sensation in the first place. Yeah, the decision probably would have been different. But as you know, in Chloe's case, there's the there's the issue that you know parents parents signed consent, and that's a separate nuance there. In your case, like you're dealing with someone with a who has a diagnosed mental condition, who they're now listening to to perform irreversible life altering surgery. On the basis that it's going to resolve that individual's mental issues, it's and I then never... saying, "Oh, you've got a really bad mental health issue. We better help you out there with that." Oops, that's what it feels like. It was like, "Oops." How on on a on a very well, so I noticed someone in the chat said, "How did I? How did we meet?" I mean, I saw your 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 Twitter your Twitter your tweet thread from yesterday. I got I I get concerned when I think that I'm reading into something, something that may or may not be there. Psychologically now, how, how are you doing? Um, I'm a Richard without a Richard, so you know what I mean? <laughs> Hold on, what, what, what was that? What, what was the expression? I'm a Richard without a Richard, because Dick is the short okay. term for Richard. In this country, so. um, yeah, I kind of... I have good days. I have some days when I've got like a lot like of stuff to focus on and trying to get um exercise and walking a lot, but there's pain and difficulty with that too. Um, like the physical stuff. Um most days I'm okay, but some days I am not. And there's nothing there's just it's just how it is. It's you know, like and it hits you at random times. There's no build up. It just sometimes you just catch yourself or just say something or I don't know. And and some times you just it's really really hard to to keep it together. But um, you are yeah. doing advocacy work. By the way, I'll say this before I forget. I, I from your perspective, uh, I know, I can only imagine that you the guilt. Uh, I'll say the guilt, the shame, the regret. From my perspective, I look at this and I say, I don't, I don't say this is someone who did something that they regret. I, 
I consider this to be an injury. In my view, you're, you you have been injured. It's as though you got into a car accident with a, with a with a you know a wildly unpredictable outcome. You have been injured by, uh, despite the fact that you consented to the injury, you have been injured by a system. And I, I would imagine that you know if, if if you take out the shame and the regret and the blaming yourself for what happened and and appreciate that this was this was an act of a, another who ought to have known better and treat it like an injury, maybe it becomes somehow easier to. To, to, to internalize, but I, I, I suspect it's just impossible. Uh, but I suspect advocacy and what you're doing to, to, to raise awareness is itself maybe the, you know, the, the way you can internalize it and give back and, and try to prevent other people from going through this. Uh, what are you doing these days? Um, yeah, I would say that's a good um, like roundup of the advocacy. I just don't want to turn into that lifelong advocate that just does it forever because they got traumatized at one point and they can't get out of trying to help others, not like and save themselves from this trauma sort of thing. Um, so I don't want to do it for too much longer, maybe six months, 12 months. Don't know. I don't know. It depends how the case goes. But my whole thing was to bring awareness and to tell people that especially people who who have went in in the in like similar angles as myself that you know you don't have to just live as trans for the rest of your life or do the worst thing you know there, there is life after and it is going to be difficult um and i'm just finding more and more people like me and the, every person i speak to you would think like there's no su surprises but i get shocked every time the shit i hear it's what's going on in the world man people like in the in the the so-called civilized developed world it's mind-blown and when people fully understand what's happening to people no matter how old they are it it'll just break people's minds you know if i had less dignity like i said in that thread i would show people and you know i'm not gonna but it would end there and then it really would like you've got no idea until you see it you see, you think those top scars and girls are pretty bad with a scar across the chest you've seen them like you really haven't it just doesn't look good okay we're going to end this on a, on a on an uplifting note richie what, what do you do for fun in the uk now what do you do for what do you do for work and what do you do um to to spiritually heal yourself through distraction and through something totally unrelated Oh God. Um, well, I I work in uh, IT. I'll just put it that way. Okay. I work in IT. <laughs> that doesn't sound very exciting. Let's, let's, <laughs> I'm joking. I, if I, I told you what my job was, it would take away a lot of privacy. I've got a re I've got an interesting job. I like my job. I just don't want Good. to talk too much about what I do because of the work I do. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and the advocacy, and I don't want to ruin that. And I'm sure it will get ruined at some point, but. Whilst I've got my job, I want to keep it. So I'm trying not to mention too much about it. Um, in my spare time, I write. I love writing. I find it super cathartic. Um, I'm writing my own sort of story out at the minute. I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I am writing it. And after that, I would love to do some creative writing. And in April, I am scheduled to join an archery club to be an English long bowman. <laughs> an archery club to be an English long bowman. What? Yep. Uh, bow and arrow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's, uh, I guess in the UK, you don't have, um, I guess you don't have gun competitions, so you have to have bow and arrow competitions. <laughs> well, um, no, we do. There is, there are shooting clubs. Uh, gun, like you can own a gun here. I would never be allowed to own a gun because of me, me history. It's very tightly controlled. Like, so if you, if you're on SSRIs, even if you've got no mental health diagnosis, you can't have them. Um, it's extraordinarily hard. You've got to have a lockup that gets inspected and the ammo has to be stored a certain amount of feet away in another vault like it is so hard to own a gun in this country um and i'm kind of glad in a way uh not that i'm gonna get involved in your shit right i'm just saying from my perspective i will rich richie I'm, I'm canadian so we have the exact we oh, have similar okay. gun laws like yeah. I, I i took the firearm course you have to go i did a two-day course i could only own an unrestricted long arm so like a rifle yeah like you say can't be stored loaded 
ammunition has to be in a separate location. And my goodness, yeah. the, the penalties for violating that it's, it's prohibitive and it's almost, it almost criminalizes gun ownership, but, and it, small arms, forget it. You need a special license for that. You re like to get past it. You really need to be into it and, or you need a really good purpose for it. So like a lot of farmers might have them or whatever. But as for me, I just thought, you know what? I love, I love archery. I love medieval shit anyway and i was like fuck it i'm gonna i'm gonna learn the longbow and there's nothing anyone can do to stop me and you, you have you ever explored fishing fishing is my is my cathartic relief i went fishing once or twice with me dad and i did i kind of enjoyed it but i really struggled like putting live bait on and like killing and batting I'd, I'd, you know i don't think so because I, I can't hurt things like i've really struggled like especially when you would catch a fish and my dad would just have it in the bucket and they're just lying there just looking all Locked, traumatized locked. and shit and i'm like no fuck, do this. I, anyway. I took my daughter to the uh to the pier uh, down here the deerfield pier and like yeah people you know they they catch small fish they leave them flopping around they use them as bait i, I try to be more humane even when you know dispatching of a fish that i'm going to eat but so i turned one kid off the other one still likes it so the, I, I got that um and uh, what do you have? So what do you have going forward? Like, uh, where can people find you? Uh, I am on Twitter at Tulip, T-U-L-L-I-P-R. I think it's on the description, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and you can see me on Twitter. I'll do the occasional sad post once in a while. But it's mainly just shit posting. Um, I do a lot of shit posting and I like to shit post, you know. Um, and that's where you can find me, I suppose. And um, in the future, like I said, um, I'm doing a lot of writing and I'm just waiting to hear from the QC with the court case because that kind of rules everything, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, that's where I'm well, at. It, it's, you've got, I see you've got a story to tell. You've got your story to tell. People need to hear it. And um, it's, I don't want to be the cliche and say it's brave and, and courageous and, and it takes um, humility to, 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 to do it. I, I don't think anybody can possibly understand um, what is involved in you telling your story as openly as you're telling it. So I, first of all, thank you for responding to me and thank you for coming on um, to talk That's about it. All right, I'm going to leave. We're going to stay here. We'll say our proper goodbyes afterwards. Everyone in the chat, I didn't get to any questions. I'm sorry. I was, I was, I was too, I'll, I'll take questions later and we'll talk about it later, but um Richie, thank you very much. Everybody in the chat, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. Peace out, peeps.